after economic protests in Iran take a deadly turn. The president praised the uprising in a move that drew high praise and considerable criticism as his approach to the unusual demonstrations is markedly different from the Obama administration's response during the last major protest eight years ago. National Security Correspondent Jennifer Griffin starts us off tonight from the Pentagon. Good evening, Jennifer. Good evening, Mike. The angry protests have spread across Iran, killing 13 people since Saturday, according to Iranian state television. Hundreds have been arrested, but so far, Iran's Revolutionary Guard has stayed on the sidelines, not cracking down on the protesters as they have in the past. For the fifth straight day, protesters have taken to cities across Iran, calling for the Iranian regime to meet their economic needs. In a sign of how unprecedented these protests are, they shouted for the supreme leader Ayatollah Khamenei, the nation's top Islamic cleric and protector of the 1979 revolution, to step down. From Florida, President Trump encouraged the Iranian people. Iran is failing at every level despite the terrible deal made with them by the Obama administration. The great Iranian people have been repressed for many years. They are hungry for food and for freedom. Along with human rights, the wealth of Iran is being looted. Time for change. The vice president also weighed in. As long as at real Donald Trump is POTUS and I am VP, the United States of America will not repeat the shameful mistake of our past when others stood by and ignored the heroic resistance of the Iranian people as they fought against their brutal regime. So the Prime Minister of Israel sent encouragement as well. And when this regime finally falls, and one day it will, Iranians and Israelis will be great friends once again. I wish the Iranian people success in their noble quest for freedom. President Obama's National Security Advisor Susan Rice scoffed at the Trump administration's approach. How can Trump help Iran's protesters? Be quiet. In 2009, the Obama administration initially chose to say nothing, so the regime could not blame the protests on outside interference from the U.S. That was the Obama approach. If I were Trump, I'd do the exact opposite of Obama. Obama said, I don't want to get involved. I don't want to mess up the chance of getting a deal with Iran. Well, the deal with Iran hasn't worked. The money didn't go to benefit the people. It went to benefit the Ayatollah and his henchmen. It's not enough to watch. President Trump is tweeting uh, very sympathetically to the Iranian people. But you just can't tweet here. You have to lay out a plan. We do not want to make the same mistake that America made uh, before in 1956, calling opposition out in Hungary and standing by watching while Soviet tanks crushed the opposition. Iran's president finally acknowledged the protesters in a New Year's Eve address and hinted at a crackdown. The government will definitely not tolerate those groups who are after the destruction of public properties or disrupting the public order or sparking riots in the society. Late today, reports of another death of an Iranian policeman shot and killed by a protester, raising concerns that this latest development could be used as an excuse by the regime to crack down. Already, regime leaders are blaming the U.S. and Iran's president reminded Iranians in a tweet that President Trump, who he referred to as this guy in America, had recently called them terrorists. Mike? Jennifer Griffin leading us off at the Pentagon tonight. Jennifer, thanks very much. President Trump lobbed another Twitter attack today, this time aimed at Pakistan, and that country's leaders tweeted back with a promise to sort facts from fiction. Correspondent Steve Harrigan is in West Palm Beach, Florida tonight with the story. Ten days of golf in the Florida sun did nothing to take the edge off the president's Twitter feed, which began the new year with a blistering critique of the U.S. relationship with Pakistan. The United States has foolishly given Pakistan more than $33 billion in aid over the last 15 years, and they have given us nothing but lies and deceit, thinking of our leaders as fools. They give safe haven to the terrorists we hunt in Afghanistan with little help. No more. The initial response from Pakistan was muted. The foreign minister responded on Twitter, We'll respond to President Trump's tweet shortly, inshallah. We'll let the world know the truth. 
difference between facts and fiction. Relations between Pakistan and the U.S. have soured in recent months, particularly after Pakistan reportedly refused to hand over one of the captors of an American woman, Caitlin Coleman, held by the Taliban for five years with her Canadian husband and children. A National Security Council official told Fox News that as of now, the U.S. is not planning to send a scheduled $255 million in aid to Pakistan. The president's tweets occurred along a predictable pattern during the working vacation in Florida. A few messages posted in the early morning, followed by 18 holes of golf, often with PGA Tour golfers, then a few more messages posted after the round. There were efforts to keep the golf itself private, palm trees and trucks placed to block the tiny windows discovered by photographers. As he has for the past decade, the president celebrated New Year's Eve at his private club Mar-a-Lago, where he predicted a banner 2018. We're going to have a great year. It's going to be a fantastic 2018. We're off to a very good start, as you know, with the great tax cuts and ANWR and getting rid of the individual mandate, which was very, very unpopular, as you know. But we are going to have a tremendous year. The stock market, I think, is going to continue to go up. Companies are going to continue to come into the country. The only political meeting on the agenda was a lunch with Florida Governor Rick Scott, where the two reportedly discussed infrastructure projects in Florida. Scott is said to be eyeing a possible Senate run in 2018. The first item on the White House agenda, a meeting with congressional leaders to avoid a government shutdown. Mike? Steve Harrigan on the start of the president's new year. Steve, thanks a lot. President Trump promised last month to bring bureaucratic red tape to a, quote, sudden, screeching, beautiful halt. But can he do it? Correspondent Rich Edson takes a look. Actions of my administration. Among its most effective initiatives, the Trump administration has withdrawn, delayed, rescinded, and dismantled significant federal regulations on the environment, financial system, and economy. The Conservative Competitive Enterprise Institute says the Federal Register in pages is now about a third smaller from the record the Obama administration set in 2016 and is the lowest count since 1993. We've got a lot of the rules and regulations. People suffered from that to a certain extent, too, in all fairness. But a lot of the regulations were voided. Nearly a year ago, President Trump signed an executive order requiring agencies to rescind two regulations for every new rule they plan to issue. The White House says the Trump administration actually cut 22 regulations for every new one and froze 1,500 Obama-era rules very tough to roll things back. So in that respect, what I think is that with respect to a president acting alone within the rule of law, Trump has done the best that I think a president could reasonably ex be expected to do. While the Trump administration has aggressively targeted President Obama's environmental regulations, federal courts have slowed this administration, and litigation will likely continue against the president's agenda. Investors say businesses have largely approved of the Trump administration's unilateral success in downsizing federal rules, though it is unclear whether it can continue its pace this year without more support from Congress. There are certain elements in 2018 that could present some, some trickier problems. I think NAFTA reform is a very, it is an issue that's fraught with potential problems for the, for the investment community. Uh, and so the White House is going to want to be really careful there in terms of how they, they handle that. And Democrats who say they'll challenge this administration. They say they're getting rid of regulation, they're getting rid of protections. Uh, they make it easier to pollute the air our children breathe and the water our children dr drink. They've dismantled net neutrality that protects consumers and entrepreneurs. It's difficult to measure a reduction in federal regulation. Each rule has a unique impact and different cost or benefit. Some are easier to rescind or rewrite. Though the reaction from the president's supporters and detractors has been emphatic as the Trump administration steadily pushes its regulatory agenda. Mike? Thanks, Rich. Congress gets back to work this week on tackling the president's ambitious agenda for 2018. South Dakota Senator John Thune joins us with a preview of the work ahead. Good evening, Senator. Happy New Year. Good evening, Mike. Happy New Year to you. Well, as you know, the government runs out of money late night on January 19th. Are you expecting a funding deal to last through the end of the fiscal year, the end of September, or another short-term extension, sir? 
I certainly hope it's through the end of the fiscal year. We need to get the, the funding issue solved. Uh, one of the issues that's of real concern to a lot of our members, uh, Mike, is making sure that we are adequately funding the military. We've got a lot of national security requirements that need to be met, and uh, we haven't been keeping up with that. And so that's going to be a big priority. I hope that big deal happens uh, by the 19th to fund the government through the end of the fiscal year, and then we can move on to some of the other uh, big issues that are also on uh, our agenda and on the president's agenda. Another big issue on that agenda, of course, is DACA, those children who are brought to this country illegally by their parents. What's your expectation on that front, sir? Well, that's an issue that, uh, as you know, has to be addressed. I think we have a March deadline associated with that. I'm hoping that we can move a freestanding bill. But when you address the DACA issue, you have to address the broader issue of illegal immigration. And I'm hopeful that we can find a bipartisan path forward that enables us to, to deal with DACA uh, and, and come up with a solution for that, but at the same time uh, ensure that we are addressing the underlying problem, and that is the, you know, that we continue to have uh, a lot of people come into this country illegally and there are ways in which we can uh, prevent that from happening, slow that, that uh, in migration that we have in this country and I'm hoping that uh, this opportunity will enable us finally to address an issue that's really long overdue. Uh, this is something that as we know uh, needs to get done and hasn't, done, hasn't gotten done for a long time. Is infrastructure an area where there could be some bipartisanship this year, Senator? I think it is. Historically, at least, uh, infrastructure has represented an opportunity for the parties to come together. Uh, I'm certainly in favor of uh, doing things to modernize our infrastructure, whether that's roads or bridges or uh, broadband. There are lots of uh, infrastructure needs that we have in this country, and uh, I'm hoping that there will be Democrats who are willing to come to the table. The question, I guess, is as you head into 2018, which is a, another even-numbered year, another election year, whether the Democrats will want to work with Republicans. Republicans, but uh, we're, we're ready to be partners with them. I believe the president and his team uh, want to move forward with an infrastructure bill that addresses a lot of these needs that we have around the country. And I think it could be a big accomplishment uh, for the American people. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping at least that we'll, we'll see the, uh, the willingness of uh, the Democrats to, to join us in that endeavor. National security issues do not stop over the holidays. Here's how your colleague Lindsey Graham referred to two of the hot spots in the world. The president has drawn a line in North Korea telling the regime, I will never let you hit America with a nuclear tipped missile. If I have to, I'll use military force to stop you. Now the Iranians are watching the way he engages with North Korea and vice versa. So we got a chance here to deliver some fatal blows to really bad actors in 2018. But if we blink, God help us all. Senator, how high are the stakes right now on North Korea and Iran? They're, they're very high. I think that Senator Graham has assessed it uh, quite accurately and uh, you know, this could be a very critical year with respect to both of those uh, areas of the world and uh, those are the hot spots or other places around the world. The world as we know is a, a very dangerous place which is why it's doubly important that we uh, invest adequately in our national security uh, priorities and we've got a lot of ground to make up there but I think that as we deal with North Korea, as we deal with the issue of Iran, uh, we need to project strength we need to involve as much as we can the international community and I think that's happening with respect to North Korea but these regimes around the world that are that have nuclear capabilities or trying to acquire nuclear capabilities and have uh, the the wherewithal to use them in a way that would be very harmful to either the region or the world have to be dealt with and uh, I think again it's going to take a concerted effort but I think we've made some inroads there I think the president and his team have been very good in in the way that they've gone about um, handling what are, uh, you know, crisis situations in the world, but projecting American strength, letting the, these dictators know, these authoritarian regimes know that uh, we're not going to sit idly by and allow them to, uh, to acquire the most dangerous weapons. Senator, your new reality in the United States Senate this year is a 51-49 split with a Democrat now representing Alabama. Uh, the Real Clear Politics average of the 2018 generic congressional vote favors Democrats by 12 12.8. How worried are you about this year's midterm election, sir? 
I think you always have to go into an election year with an awareness, particularly when you have a majority and it's a midterm election in, in, in a presidential term, that the party that is uh, in power typically loses seats. But given that, I think the best way for us to overcome what might be uh, some of those historical um, you know, trends is for us to put up a record of accomplishment. And that's why passing tax reform, meaningful tax reform that's going to bring uh, you know, meaningful tax relief to hardworking Americans in this country, middle income families, I think is going to be really uh, essential as people start to evaluate this president, uh, this Republican majority, and their ability to get the things done in the areas that the American people care about. And fundamentally, most people in this country care deeply about the economy. They care about those pocketbook, uh, kitchen table issues. I think tax reform strikes at the very heart of that. If we can uh, you know, move forward this year, continue to lessen this regulatory burden, unleash this economy, which is already starting to pick up speed, thanks to some of the steps that the administration and the Congress have taken. Uh, I think this could be a very good year for the economy and uh, in a year in which the American people take an you know, assessment of this administration and this Congress and say, you know what, uh, these folks are getting results for, uh, for the American people and they're making a difference in my life. And I think ultimately that's what, uh, you know, as people make their determinations next fall, uh, are going to be looking at. Is my, am I better off than I was uh, before these, these folks came to office? Senate Democratic Leader Chuck Schumer is already signaling major changes to tax reform if Democrats take back the majority. Take a listen to this. There are probably a small number of provisions we might not repeal, but we'd certainly it certainly would need drastic overhaul, aiming it at the middle class, not at the wealthy and powerful. Is that trying to fire up Democrat voters, sir? It is, and they, they clearly have a strategy that, uh, you know, runs, uh, try to uh, sort of obstruct at all cost. Uh, they were not willing participants in tax reform. Uh, I hope that they are in some of these issues that we mentioned earlier. But the, the, the fact is, uh, Mike, as we head into this election year, there is a very different philosophy. As you listen to Chuck, Chuck Schumer and other Democrats talk, uh, these are people who believe that the federal government in Washington uh, knows better how to spend your money than you do. And the reason I think that they were not willing to participate in the effort to, to lessen the tax burden of people in this country is that they have that fundamental belief. We, we believe the best way to lift people's uh, economic standing in this country is to get a stronger growing economy that's creating better paying jobs and raising wages and, uh, and Democrats typically are more interested in growing government and I think fundamentally that's where uh, we have this, uh, this uh, division and this is the, the choice that the American people are going to be faced with. Do you want people who are going to allow you to have more control, more freedom, more flexibility, more power in your daily lives, or do you want to hand that to Washington, D.C.? Senator John Thune from the great state of South Dakota. Look forward to seeing you back here on the Hill soon, sir. Safe travels. We'll see you soon. Thanks, Mike. Coming up, a new year and a new report on just what may have led to the investigation into Russia collusion. New details tonight on how the Russia probe apparently got started as we learn the long-awaited review of the FBI's handling of the Clinton email scandal may be public soon. Chief Intelligence Correspondent Catherine Herridge joins us live tonight with the details. Good evening, Catherine. Thank you, Mike. The Justice Department Inspector General Michael E. Horowitz began his investigation into the handling of the Clinton email case a year ago this month, and his findings that could become public at any time may create new obstacles for Special Counsel Robert Mueller. While the Horowitz investigation is separate from the Russia probe, it is having a direct impact. IG investigators discovered the anti-Trump text messages between FBI agent Peter Strzok and FBI lawyer Lisa Page with whom he was having an extramarital affair. Strzok and Page were reassigned by Mueller, but the president's ally seized on the text as evidence of political bias. The IG is also investigating former Attorney General Loretta Lynch and former FBI Director James Comey, who leaked memos to the media documenting his meetings with President Trump. In recent congressional testimony, the new FBI director hinted at the potential weight of the IG findings. When we make mistakes, there are independent processes like that of the outside independent inspector general that will drive and dive deep into the facts surrounding those mistakes. And when that independent fact finding is complete, we will hold our folks accountable if that's appropriate. The IG is also investigating whether Deputy FBI Director Andrew McCabe, who testified last month behind closed doors, should have recused himself from the Clinton probe because his wife received more than $700,000 from Democrats. McCabe wants to retire in March when he's eligible for full benefits, but the IG report may impact the timing, Mike.
Catherine, have we heard anything from fired FBI Director James Comey recently? Well, in a New Year's tweet, Comey said he hoped for more ethical leadership focused on truth and lasting values. The New York Times is also reporting a May 2016 meeting between Trump campaign aide George Papadopoulos and an Australian diplomat may have kick-started the FBI Russia case. Papadopoulos told the diplomat the Russians had damaging information on Hillary Clinton. But the timeline may be more nuanced. As Fox first reported, the Justice Department extradited the Romanian hacker Guccifer, who used Russian proxy servers to compromise the email account of Clinton aide Sidney Blumenthal in 2013. The hack three years earlier first exposed Clinton's use of unsecured personal servers. The House Intelligence Committee investigation appears to be moving faster than those led by Senator Burr, whose investigators are also focused on Russian interference in the electoral process through propaganda and hacking. Senator Grassley's team has FBI and Justice Department oversight. A lack of cooperation over the Trump dossier has in fact spun off another House probe into alleged abuse of U.S. government surveillance. This is the problem with DOJ and FBI. They become, I hate to use the word corrupt, but they become at least so dirty that who's watching the watchmen? Who's investigating these people? There is no one. The House Committee's Republican leadership wants to finalize their Russia report in the next couple of months, Mike. Catherine Herridge, a busy year ahead on the intelligence front. Catherine, thanks You're very welcome. much. Baltimore set a horrific record for 2017, a new standard for murder. The Maryland city had a per capita homicide record of 343 killings last year, roughly 56 murders for every 100,000 people. Violent crime rates in the city have been notoriously high for decades, but the murder rates started to surge after the death of a black man in police custody in 2015. New Year's Day for many means starting fresh with new resolutions. One place turning a new leaf in 2018, California, where recreational pot is now legal. Correspondent Marianne Rafferty reports from Los Angeles. Cannabis consumers ring in the new year on a high, lining up early at dispensaries around the Golden State. The attainment of positivity, something to show some light to where it is not necessarily negative. Only a handful of stores like this one, an hour from Los Angeles, received a state license to open today. That's because it was left up to local jurisdictions to approve licensing. Larger cities like L.A. and San Francisco are still working out the details, but dispensaries already used to selling medical cannabis are ready to serve the public. It's going to change from uh, dispensing medication and it's like, oh, I hope you feel better to enjoy the high. <laughs> California is the sixth state to legalize recreational pot, but now with added restrictions on sellers. Everything is going to have to be pre-weighed and sealed. And additional costs. I expect a 30% increase because uh, first of all, we're going to be burdened with heavier taxation and plus we're going to have to hire more staff. Cannabis sales have been legal for four years in Colorado. Supporters say in spite of some early stumbles, government regulation works. We can control it. We know who is producing it and who's selling it. And we know that they're following rules that will protect public health and safety. Not to mention millions in new tax revenue for state and local governments. In California, lawmakers hope to collect $1 billion in 2018 and billions more in years to come. But opponents of legalization say it's not worth it. What we've seen when that use increases is things like the traffic fatalities increasing, um, the use obviously of youth and adults increasing. Um, we also look at things like ERs and hospitalizations and homelessness and a whole other realm of things um, that are unintended consequences. What happens in California is yet to be seen. The new law says you must be at least 21 to buy, you can't smoke in public, and road signs along many California highways remind drivers that driving while high is still DUI. Mike? Marianne Rafferty reporting from Los Angeles. Marianne, thank you. Up next, North Korea's leader says nuclear weapons are not just a threat from his regime, but a reality. First, here's what some of our Fox affiliates are around the country are covering tonight. Fox 31 in Denver, where investigators say one sheriff's deputy was killed and three other deputies were wounded when a man carried out an ambush-style attack on them in Douglas County, Colorado. The suspect was known to police, but had no criminal record. A SWAT team then killed the man in a shootout during which another officer was injured. 
Fox 13 in Seattle, where the new year means a new tax on sugary drinks. Distributors will pay the tax of nearly two cents, two cents per fluid ounce, but customers are also expected to see price increases. The city is now among a handful of places nationwide that have a soda tax. And this is a live look at Los Angeles from Fox 11. Earlier today in Pasadena, the 129th annual Rose Parade went off without a hitch. Actor Gary Sinise served as Grand Marshal of the festivities, where the theme was making a difference. That's tonight's live look outside the Beltway from Special Report. We'll be right back. Around 1,400 cars were destroyed in a huge fire at a parking garage in England. Flames from the fire engulfed several floors of the garage outside an arena in Liverpool. Police say one car that caught fire may have started the blaze that even threatened horses stabled in the garage for performances at the arena. Thankfully, no one was hurt. The threat of a nuclear North Korea is now a reality and the U.S. is within its strike range. That's the word from Kim, Kim Jong-un who, who warned today he has a button to destroy his enemies right on his desk. Correspondent Kitty Logan reports on whether it is more rhetoric or reality. It was an opportunity to saber rattle. The anti-U.S. rhetoric was tougher than ever. The warning clear. The entire U.S. mainland is within the range of our nuclear strike, and the button is always on the table in my office. They should clearly know that this is certainly not a threat, but rather a reality. North Korea regularly tested missiles throughout 2017. It's thought the intercontinental ballistic missiles observed in the most recent tests could have sufficient range to reach the U.S. But there are still questions about whether these could carry nuclear warheads. We need a very careful calibration exactly what the North's capabilities are. I think they've made incredible advances in the past year. They're very close to crossing the finish line, but they haven't done it yet. And if he has a nuclear button on his desk, maybe he could give us a copy of it too. Despite the threats to the U.S., there were warmer words directed towards its ally, South Korea. Kim Jong-un suggested sending a delegation to the upcoming Winter Olympics in the South. He also said he wanted to reduce tensions on the Korean Peninsula and would be more open to dialogue with Seoul. This was welcomed by the South Korean government. The Blue House welcomes Chairman Kim Jong-un raising the necessity to improve the South-North Korean relationship while mentioning the willingness to send North Korean athletes to the Pyeongchang Winter Olympics in his New Year speech and the suggestion that the two governments hold a meeting to discuss the issue. But despite the New Year's goodwill towards Seoul, for now, South Korea lies in the North's firing line. Whether there's a diplomatic follow-up remains to be seen. Kim Jong-un says North Korea would act as a responsible nuclear power. But even by attempting to develop a nuclear capability, the country has defied a UN ban and drawn criticism from the wider international community. North Korea's rhetoric towards the US is often fiery and hostile in tone. The question is, how serious are these threats? Or does North Korea simply want to assert its power on the global stage? Mike? Kitty Logan reporting on the North Korea threat. Kitty, thanks. A team of archaeologists and hundreds of teen volunteers have unearthed the remains of a 1,500-year-old monastery and church in Israel. Correspondent Connor Powell from Jerusalem tonight with a look at religious history. In the hills outside of Jerusalem, archaeologists have discovered a unique Byzantine church dating back to the earliest days of Christianity. It was likely built during the 5th century, just after Christianity became the legal religion of the Roman Empire, and the church was likely used by Christian pilgrims traveling to the Holy Land. Archaeologists believe the site was roughly 25 by 40 meters in size, not only large for the time period, but also for the region. And many of these original walls are still intact, some as tall as 6 feet. Unlike many smaller churches in the area, this one was incredibly well decorated, a sign of its importance. This also has is a window screen. So not only was the, the inside decorated, but also to the outside they were decorating the building. And the builders use marble, which is not found locally. There were pre-made elements that were shipped all the way from Turkey by boat 
there was a massive amount of planning that had to go and a lot of donations that went on uh, to decorate this church. But the stunning find of the church is its mosaic floors, which are extremely well preserved and decorated with images of birds and pomegranates. The preservation of this floor is actually quite remarkable. We have it from wall to wall. The only little damage are uh, stone collapse. These, these are the remains of stones that would have smashed down into the floor and that's the only damage. Other than that, it's complete. With only 20% of this site having been excavated, it still isn't clear yet who built and paid for this Byzantine church. But underneath these piles of dirt, these diggers will likely find out. In Beit Shemesh, Israel, Connor Powell, Fox News. Connor Powell reporting from the Holy Land. Up next, our panel reacts to the uprising in Iran and the administration's response to it. First, beyond our borders tonight. The new year begins with more reports of heavy fighting in Syria. A human rights group says clashes have broken out between government forces and insurgents east of Damascus. Dozens of civilians are among those killed. Ten Americans are dead following a fiery plane crash in Costa Rica. The charter plane crashed Sunday in a wooded area shortly after takeoff. Five of the dead have been identified by relatives as Bruce and Irene Steinberg and their three sons. Pope Francis offered up some resolutions for the new year today, telling worshipers to get rid of life's, quote, useless baggage and focus instead on building a peaceful and welcoming world, particularly for refugees and migrants. The Pope gave the statements as part of a New Year's Day mass, mass in St. Peter's Basilica and later greeted some 40,000 people in the square. Just some of the other stories beyond our borders tonight. We'll be right back. The government will definitely not tolerate those groups who are after the destruction of public properties or disrupting the public order or sparking riots in our society. Our people will not tolerate it either. If I were President Trump, I would uh, have a nationwide address pretty soon explaining uh, why the Iranian nuclear deal is a bad deal for the world, what a better deal would look like, and urge Congress and the European allies to get a better deal with Iran uh, before it's too late. You just can't can't tweet here. You have to lay out a plan. And of course, we are looking at the Iran protests that have erupted in recent days. Let's bring in our panel, Tom Rogan, commentary writer for the Washington Examiner, Mara Liason, national political correspondent of National Public Radio, and Molly Hemingway, senior editor at The Federalist. Ladies, gentlemen, Happy New Year. You. Happy New Year to you. Molly, your read on the Iranian protests? Well, it has just been quite dramatic to follow this news over the last couple of days. I think it shows us that contrary to what people have been saying about Iran being a regime that is very unified, or the country being unified and everybody is emboldened by their shared hatred of Donald Trump that you actually have at least a large contingent that is not pleased with Iran. They aren't pleased with their foreign intervention. They're very upset with the corruption of the regime and the economic, the bad economic effects of that. And so whether regime change is likely is, is a, a huge question. I don't think it's likely, but this is still a dramatic turn of events. No surprise, President Trump turned to Twitter to talk about the protests that we are seeing. Let's take a look at that. Iran is failing at every level despite the terrible deal made with them by the Obama administration. The great Iranian people have been repressed for many years. They are hungry for food and for freedom. Along with human rights, the wealth of Iran is being looted. Time for change. And no surprise, former Ambassador Susan Rice of the Obama administration had a very different view. She was tweeting, how can Trump help Iran's protesters be quiet? Mara, you've covered both administrations. Your thoughts on well, what we're seeing. President Obama was more restrained than President Trump because his administration believed that if he showed too much support for the protesters, it would backfire and the regime would paint them as a kind of American puppet movement. Donald Trump doesn't feel that way. He's going out much stronger in favor of them. But as Lindsey Graham says, you've got to have a strategy. Does this mean that he should reimpose sanctions on Iran? Remember, he decertified the deal, but he didn't. And Congress hasn't at least reimposed sanctions. So what does he do next? That's the big question. How does he support these protests? Because there have been protests in the past during the Obama administration, and they didn't go anywhere. 
Tom, your thoughts on what he does next? Well, I think the, the most obvious thing it can do is to try as much as possible uh, to keep Wi-Fi networks in operation. The Iranians are really putting bigger steps in shutting citywide. The U.S. has the capability to, to provide some measure of relief there. At the same time, I think there's an opportunity in the portfolio of the Iran nuclear deal to make the case to the Europeans uh, to embarrass them on the international human rights concerns, which they talk a lot about, and say, listen, the nature of this regime, why don't we go back to the drawing board as they are trying to do at the moment in getting ballistic missile, um, counterpoints into the deal, uh, more vigorous inspections at military sites. Why don't we restructure this so that there is more of a moral concern about where the sanctions relief money goes, that it doesn't go to Lebanese Hezbollah and missiles into Riyadh, that it might go to a private, you know, an, a European or American company in private and private public partnership uh, with an Iranian company that isn't linked to the Revolutionary Guards. That's very in the weeds, but but there are functional opportunities here. And I think Trump, quite frankly, is right to, to make that case on Twitter, the moral case, food and freedom, uh, because, you know, there's a lot of arrogance from the Obama people say, oh, we have to stay quiet. We were so important, Obama's words. This is a domestic Iranian thing that will flow on the merits of public. And it's worth remembering, too, that the Obama administration wasn't just quiet because they thought that it would be helpful to the protesters. In fact, they didn't want to be helpful to the protesters. Everything was subverted to the overarching Obama administration goal of getting that Iran nuclear deal. And that included, you know, as we learned in recent days, uh, not investigating the Hezbollah operation fully, where they deliver millions of dollars of cocaine to Europe and the United States. But everything, because the Obama administration believed that the, um, the mullahs were going to be in power for a long time and that they kind of placed their bets with them and they find this moment probably very embarrassing because uh, this, this type of unrest is contrary to the narrative that they have sold and that has been carried by a lot of media outlets too. No surprise, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has a strong opinion about what's going on on the streets of Iran. Let's take a listen to him. This regime tries desperately to sow hate between us, but they won't succeed. And when this regime finally falls, and one day it will, Iranians and Israelis will be great friends once again. I wish the Iranian people success in their noble quest for freedom. And Mara, obviously for the Israelis, the best possible scenario would be something dumping the regime oh, sure. in Iran to avoid a military conflict. Sure, but the question again is, what is the best thing that Israel and the United States can do to make that happen? Donald Trump was very clear in that treat, tweet. He wanted regime change. Time for change. So what, hap what can the U.S. and the Israelis do to make sure that happens? It, we've been for regime change for a very long time. There have been protests in the past, and we haven't gotten what we wanted. Uh, you know, and I do think, look, no, I, I think it would be crazy to, uh, you know, talk about going to war with Iran to try and sort of use a, a secondary front with the protesters.